And now to our lab, Whoa. where we do incredible experiments. Oh, it's disgusting. To show you how your body works. So watch this. Just don't try anything you see here at home. To kick off today's lab, we're using this machine to see what's in our breath. Your breath has lots of gases in it. Some are smelly, like hydrogen sulphide. It's made by the bacteria that live in your mouth, and it's what makes the bad smell when you let one rip. When it's mixed with the food and drink you've eaten, it can make your breath honk. Let's look at Chris's results. Chris, you have detectable levels of fishy cabbage smell in your breath. Oh, nice. Thanks, Sand. But actually, your breath can tell you much more than what you've had for dinner, as we're going to show you. What's going on? Who's this? This is Daisy. Am I being replaced? What are your qualifications? Sand, you're not being replaced. Daisy's here to help us with today's experiment. Because your breath can reveal a huge amount about you. It can be the first sign of many illnesses. And like your fingerprints, your breath is unique. No one else has the same breath. <sighs> it smells like doggy snacks. No. But I did find some lovely biscuits on the floor on the way in. Were they in a bowl? Yes. Did the bowl say Daisy on it? Yes. <sighs> now, everyone has bad breath at some point, even Daisy. But even if your breath isn't bad, it still has a smell, and it's the smell that contains information about you and your health. So, if you have asthma, even though you can't smell asthma, your breath will have more nitric oxide in it, which you can detect. Or if you have diabetes, your breath may have more of a compound called acetone in it. It's the same chemical that's in nail varnish remover. In fact, there's a whole range of medical conditions that can be detected on your breath. But not by us, even though we're doctors. Not by specialist medical researchers, not even by complicated equipment. That's why Daisy is here. She's a specially trained smell dog tour. Daisy's been trained by Claire to detect serious illnesses like cancer in a person's breath. So, Claire, how does Daisy do it? Well, when people are unwell, they smell different. So some people have kindly donated their breath samples onto this tube. So they breathe in that, and then the, the smelly molecules in their breath stick inside this sponge here. Absolutely. And then what we do is, in training, we show this sponge to Daisy, and we've been able to train her to tell us if somebody has a very serious disease. <laughs> Time to see Daisy in action. Now, we've laid out three samples of breath here, and one of the samples is from a patient with a serious illness. Now, the one from the patient with the illness... Chris! You can't say in front of Daisy. She'll hear. She's better find it herself. She's a dog. She doesn't speak English. It's sample A. Now, Claire, should we set off Daisy and see if she can find it? Daisy, seek, seek. She's done it. And unbelievably, it took her just six seconds. That's amazing. There was no debate. There was no... She didn't even have to check one of the samples. Yeah, she yeah. knew. As soon as she smelt that odour, she sits down and tells us she's found it. So, while Daisy is special, she's not actually got any more smell receptors than any other dog. Take Sooty and Spike here. Although they might be better at sniffing out where their ball is than detecting illness, inside their noses they have 220 million smell receptors, whereas we only have 5 million. And there are other dogs like Daisy who've been trained to sniff out different medical conditions. So if someone has diabetes, for instance, and they have the wrong level of sugar in their blood, the dog could actually detect that and warn them to take their medication. So although your breath can sometimes smell bad, its smell can also reveal vital information about your health. Claire, that was brilliant. Thank you so yeah, much for coming in. And Daisy, you did such a good job. You understand, don't you? Here you go, Chris. One baby. Tant, this is my baby. This is Lyra, your niece. Whatever. And we're going to need some of the most disgusting things we can think of. First up, worms. Here you go. Here's Ooh. some yummy worms. What do you think of that? Look at that. This is not a baby that's disgusted by a worm, is it? Fair enough. Next up, maggots. This is really them. disgusting. Look at the move. She's got one in her hand. I mean, that is not a disgusted baby, is it? 
Right, if worms and maggots don't make you feel squeamish, Lyra, I'm going to pull out all the stops with this next thing. Let's see if Lyra is disgusted by Rose. What do you think of Rose? Lyra seems very, very unbothered by Rose. And she's not bothered by the most disgusting thing of all, Dr Zahn's beard and bogeys. Not disgusted by anything. No, he's not Dada. I'm Dada. So all of those things might have made you feel a bit squeamish, but Lyra isn't reacting because she doesn't know how to feel squeamish. It's only as you get older and learn more about the world around you that you start to develop these feelings of squeamishness, usually about the same things that the adults around you don't like. So we're going to put this to the test and see what happens when you are truly grossed out. Thank you, Lyra. I think you're done. It's time to bring on some older guests who are cordially invited to our disgusting dinner. <laughs> Welcome to the Ouch Disgusting Dining Experience. Joining us are Lennon, Kitty and James. Three foolish, I mean lucky, ouchers. We are going to be serving a meal of delightfully disgusting dishes whilst they eat and monitor their faces and heart rates so we can find out what feeling squeamish does to the body. Right, grubs up. Three, two, one, and voila. Ta-da! On the menu today, jellied eels, Crickets, Mahani worms, fish eggs, stinky blue cheese, and a giant Thai water bug. This food is totally safe. We expect empty plates at the end of the meal. Oh, I don't know. Are those flies? That, is that eggs? Those are fish eggs, yeah. Oh! Oh. Now, Kitty's prepared a little spoonful of fish eggs and cooked crickets. So why don't you have a go at that? Looking at someone else eating it is like you're eating it. Our ouchers have all been making yuck faces. Their noses and foreheads wrinkled, they stuck out their tongues. This signals you're feeling disgusted and warns other people not to touch what's there. What is that? They made the yuck face because they have learnt that some things can be harmful, unlike Lyra, who hasn't learnt this yet. James is going to eat the water bug. Are you going to do it, James? Look how disgusting it is! James's pulse rate was 66, it's now 82. So even the thought of putting this into your mouth has started to make James's body prepare. He's having this thing called a fight or flight response. Oh. Your squeamish response is very similar to feeling afraid. Your heart rate increases, so you're ready to run away from whatever might be harmful. How's it going? Go. It's good. I don't believe you. Because <laughs> you're making your yuck face, you're squinting your eyes. Dessert time. Will our chocolate-covered mealworms and worm lollies also make our ouchers feel squeamish? Kitty, you're eating the chocolate with the mealworms on it. That's not bothering you? No. After our disgusting main course, sweets with a few insects don't seem so bad. Our ouchers learned from each other that they could try different things. So because they saw each other eating bugs, their squeamish feelings decreased because they learned the food wasn't harmful. Who's had this? Len's been licking that. Kitty, you'll eat the chocolate with the maggots, but you won't have the lollipop that Lennon's licked. Yeah. Why do you think you won't do that? His germs are on it. So that's an important point, is that there are some things that almost everyone is disgusted by. Poo and body fluids, particularly. 